Hello and welcome to The Hearing, our music review show here on the channel. I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's album, just a little continuation of our discussion from last week, early in the show, about our, our ideal supergroups. Um, you were having trouble finding a rhythm guitarist and a keyboardist who were currently active. Um, I'm going to start with the less interesting of these suggestions for keyboards. Okay. Um, possibly somebody from TV on the radio or Arcade Fire. They both have a lot of our instru multi-instrumentalists. I kind of thought, I mean, nothing keyboard-wise really jumps out at me from, from either of those. Okay. It just happened to think of it, but the one, yeah. the, the reason I'm bringing this up again, I thought of, I, I think the perf perfect rhythm guitars particularly work for working with Annie Clark, John Flansburg. John Flansburg from, uh, they might be giants. Oh, think hmm. of the stylistic versatility that he's pulled off in that band from Anna Actually, Ng to, you know, don't start to, um, bird has in your soul. He's good. Actually, I was thinking of Ted Leo. Oh, okay. Okay. I Another thought, of, right. oh, I that thought of Mitski, uh, but oh, I didn't know she played guitar. Yes. Yes, she does. She's kind of, she's very similar to, to St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I don't even know if they went to the same, I, I know they're both Texans okay. <laughs> and I think they might have even gone to the same school. Who knows? But she's, I think a bit younger. Um, but yeah, I think it would be interesting to have the male voice with, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Ted Leo Emily Haynes right there, and yeah. uh, St. Vincent together. Yeah. Um, yeah. And really, he plays a bunch of other instruments, too. So Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, so on to this week's album, which is from 1988, The Land of Rape and Honey by Ministry. Uh, Ministry is an American industrial band formed in 1981 in Chicago, Illinois, by vocalist and multi-instrumentalist Al Jorgensen. And Land of Rape and Honey is their third album. Um, it was the first ministry album to feature bassist Paul Barker, who would remain a member until his departure in 2004, and it marked a significant departure from the goth-influenced synth-pop of their <laughs> debut album with Sympathy. Developing, a, uh, developing on the darker and more aggressive style of their sophomore effort, Twitch, uh, into a less commercial and more industrially sound that incorporates elements of punk and heavy metal, a sound that would continue through all of their subsequent releases. The, album, the album's title comes from the slogan of Tisdale, Saskatchewan, whose motto at the time was the land of rape and honey. I had no idea someone <laughs> seriously had that as their fucking slogan. Because the, about that. the local economy was based on the agricultural products, uh, rapeseed and honey. And honestly, how do you not just find a sign in the town and get a picture yeah. of that? And that's your album cover. Uh, apparently, um, the band was visiting there and saw uh, the, the slogan on a souvenir mug and had to use it. <laughs> the album was released on October 11th, 1988, 1988, produced by Al Jorgensen, Paul Parker, and Adrian Sherwood, all under aliases, and features Al Jorgensen on vocals, guitar, and programming, Paul Parker on bass, keyboards, and programming, with additional musicians. Uh, William Riflin, apologies if I mispronounced that, on drums, programming, keyboards, guitar, and background vocals, and Chris Connolly, no, not that Chris Connolly, on background <laughs> vocals. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into the, our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description and on our blog at johnandscotto.com, you'll find links to The Land of Rape and Honey on Spotify and YouTube, so you can follow along if you'd like. Now, on to the tracks, starting with track one, Stigmata. To me, this is the definitive ministry song. I, I always thought the similarities to the intro to this and Phil Collins, Billy, You Don't Lose My Number are, yeah, yeah. are, really, are really hilarious. It's that same beat. <laughs> da, 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 da. It's like... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think it's my favorite. It's, this is my favorite on the album. I'm just gonna, yeah. I, my, getting my favorite out of the way early. Um, I think maybe that's just because it's the most familiar. You know, you've Play, you played this one for me back in the early 90s. and If yeah. you were listening to us on the radio back in the early 90s, chances are you're going to hear that you heard this song. A lot. And I've always loved it since then. However, in his autobiography, Jorgensen said that Stigmata is his least favorite song in the ministry catalog <laughs> because it's, it's so simplistic. Oh, Uncle Al. Uh, he wrote it in the, at the last minute after realizing he needed another song to complete the album. Because at this point in time, when they were recording on tape, if you didn't fill the tape, it made mastering difficult. 
Yeah. And so I, I think it's New World Man by Rush was is also a case like that. In fact, it was originally called Project 4 or something, named after the, the length of the song, because it was written to fit a certain amount of time on the album. Um, apparently, uh, Sigmato was the same case. Um, loved the, um, the three different percussion parts all panned differently in the beginning yeah. to create the beat. You've got one on the left, one on the right, one in the middle. Um, and the riff is just classic. It's, I mean, this is really where so much began. I mean, these guys really should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, I've kind of thought that, but it's like, but it's the so commercial much Hall of Fame from this. Yeah, it is. It's the same Hall the of Fame. Pop Home exactly. Hall of Fame or the Billboard you know, Hall of Fame. They never made it big at all, except for maybe five minutes after Psalm sixty nine, when when NWO and you know one more one more fix was it? Just or one, one fix. Just one yeah. fix was on MTV. That's about the only time they got any play. Um, Back to Stigmata. Um, love the love the groove that this those, those three very industrial sounding percussion parts yeah. create with this classic riff that actually isn't a guitar. It might be a sample nah, guitar, but there was no maybe. guitar recorded for the song. Um, yeah, he did a lot of. Uh, sometimes he did guitar sampling. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love the groove. It's just kind of it's angry but danceable. Like you can dance to it, but <laughs> it's the song. Weird thing with this whole album is most of the songs are danceable. Some of them are incredibly fucked up and incredibly uh, you know angst ridden and and aggressive, but yet they're very danceable. <laughs> love the distorted vocal. Um, although it gets a little emo at points. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, this, this is where emo comes from. <laughs> and I love the high squeaky. <laughs> probably guitar sample after he says the word stigmata it's just this really high guitar sounds like a guitar part that's just kind of squeaky and unsettling although i don't get the mention of stigmata like what that has to do with the rest of the lyric <laughs> it is really, it does seem like an afterthought it always has because it's really stigma. just about like someone's been lying to him presumably an ex and he's just angry about it you know, very angry about being <laughs> lied to by this person and saying you know you're all out of lies you've got empty eyes all of this stuff all makes perfect sense until he just shouts the he word stigmata. Stigmata. <laughs> love it uh, i mean actually of course this isn't where emo comes from i mean this is this is Depeche Mode meets the Sex Pistols. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what this is. I mean, this is just in your this face. This particular song, in, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, and to hear this live, <laughs> it's just. I thought I was gonna gonna die that <laughs> when I heard this live. Actually, <laughs> I really thought I was um, I was done for. I mean, I'm the only guy, as far as the eye can see, that has hair. <laughs> you know, I'm just surrounded like a football field full of skinheads, and I'm the only one with hair. Um, and they would do this that that intro where every the mosh pit would freeze between the drum beats, wow. so we're all just kind of like that, staring at each other. And that's when I noticed I'm like, oh, I'm the only one with hair here. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, that is not why I have a shaved head. <laughs> I was going bald and decided to give up the ship. <laughs> anyway, 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 on to track two, The Missing. It, it is a strong pick, though, for, oh, yeah. for, for your favorite. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I will not fault you for that at there all. There are a few who I had, that I had to choose between, but Stigmata has just got the sentimental attachment the, to me. This was tough for long. me to make my pick. Um, on to track two, The Missing. Now this is the sound that I know as ministry. Yeah, this is this is probably the most metal songs on the album. Actually, mm -hmm. it's almost it, like a it's almost rockabilly, it's, and it's kind of I would say hardcore because yeah. it's got these great blast beats with this very fast riff. Yeah, and as I have it in my notes, this is the this is the first instant, instance of their true sound. Yeah, this is when Al found the right mix. Um, loved all of the reverb on the vocal and how they kind of worked the James Bond riff in, in the middle. <laughs> Just that, that climbing bass part that you have on that on the James Bond theme, yeah. it's in the middle section of the song. Oh, that... Dun, 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 dun. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah, climbing okay. bass line. Um, it's in there. Um, only criticism on a few of these tracks um, is that I think the vocals should have been mixed higher. You know, I thought the vocals... They're not mixed the same way I remember them being mixed from when okay. I back in the day. Um, that might be I a mean, Spotify thing then. 
Maybe. You know what? Damn it. I should have listened to this on YouTube. I should always at least listen to the album once on YouTube just to get a different mm-hmm. compression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, Cause like one of the later tracks, yeah, the vocal effect comes off completely different when I'm earbuds mm-hmm. versus okay. the big headphones. Okay. Um, so my comments on my, yeah, I'll, I'll cut all my comments on the vocals getting mixed higher. Cause I'll, I'll say that maybe that was a Spotify issue. Maybe. Cause uh, yeah, there were some, I just didn't remember uh, mm-hmm. this. I mean, for, for the missing, it, we were talking about how metal, how hardcore it is mm-hmm. still danceable though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't notice that. I mean, unless, unless you're mothing, of course. You know, obviously, you can it's moth still it, kind of, it is still weirdly danceable. If you like, if you put this on like at a club, I, okay. I remember I, people I, were dancing to NWO, not moshing. I remember seeing people wow. back in the day dancing to NWO at a Cause club. Because these, these next two and one of the, there's like three songs that I would not say are danceable. These these next two, missing this one and one later. Um, but I, I okay. Apparently, you can dance to it. Um, I mean, moshing aside, of course. Yeah. Um, there's one that you just can't dance to. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get see. to. It. Yeah. Um, on to track three, Deity. Now, this one reminds me a lot of White Zombie, who I know were after this. Oh yeah. They were early '90s. I think this may be the beginning of groove metal. It may be. I, this has always been one of my favorites. This one, that riff with the uh, the Motown keyboard horns, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, great blast beats. Um, uh, the verse riff I think goes on a bit too long before it changes. But that's always been a criticism I've had of Ministry is they like to stick into one groove for a little too long. Yeah. Um, solos are interesting. I can't really tell if the first one is a guitar. <laughs> Who knows? Or a keyboard. Um, I think the second one is a guitar. I like um, that he didn't rely on vocal effects as much on this one as others. That mm-hmm. it's just a screamer, you know. And he just he throws a ton of reverb in there, but that's yeah. About it. it doesn't throw much else. Not a lot of not a lot of distortion. Not that mm-hmm. I have anything against the vocal effects that he uses, mm-hmm. but this one it was just nice to have a straight up, yeah, yeah. you know, fist to the chin. And even the vocal <laughs> reminds me of Rob Zombie. Hmm. You know, he's got this certain kind of throaty sound that, I mean, Jorgensen always had, but I think yeah. he changes it up a little bit. And I'm not saying, you know, obviously, Zombie was always lazy, I thought, though. But I think maybe he pulled a bit from this song. Oh, I think he did. I think yeah. he pulled a lot from Al. Mm-hmm. Um, loved the sudden stop in the middle. It just oh, yeah. stops out of nowhere. <laughs> I, ha- I was taking notes. I had to look at the timeline. Like, wait, is it over? And then it picked up a couple seconds later. Yeah. On to track three, Golden Dawn. Now, this one uh, begins an issue I have with the album. Um, first off, love the chaotic opening. This one has a nice, very 80s style groove. This sounds yeah. very, this is very dated, very of its time. Yeah. And w- when we reviewed Big Wreck some weeks ago, earlier in the year, you criticized it for being a product of its time. I didn't understand that until I got to this <laughs> review. Because that album I've loved since it was released, you know, and I've listened to it consistently since then, so I wasn't the most objective. This album, you know, with Ministry, I've all, all I've heard is Stigmata until today. So wow. I went, I went into this one, and you know, I got you know Stigmata, which I know and love. Two songs which are the Ministry that I have come to know, you know, aggressive and brutal and hardcore. We get to Golden Dawn, and it's very eighties. It's very weird. <laughs> It's got some nice lead guitar on it. Love the bass sound. He's got some pick slides in there. And how can you get more 80s than a pick slide? <laughs> I think the movie clips go on a little too long that the audio clips. That it's the whole in. song. Yeah. It, it's the, I, I didn't also didn't realize that there was this Alistair you know, Crowley obsession they had, but I looked up like, yeah, what is this about anyway? And it's about like the, I guess the black magic uh, or the, okay. the the call the keys or the call. Yeah, yeah. and Golden called. Dawn. It's not as far as I can tell from the samples. They're not talking about the terrorist organization. No. They're talking about a a cult, a religious that, cult. That chant that's kind of played there. That is actually Alistair Crowley's voice. I believe okay. uh-huh. they actually have like some of his audio recording that they put in. They they like, triple downed on them. I, I saw the title and it decided to research Golden Dawn because I wasn't exactly sure what it was. There are two Golden Dawns. One is the terrorist yeah. organization. The other is a religious cult. Clearly, this is about the religious cult, or at least the title references them. Yeah. Um, 
I, I and again, it's a criticism I have of ministry is they tend to get stuck into sections and they <laughs> run them a bit too long. They're a little repetitive, but it's an issue I've always had with them, and it's minor. So it's really the music is just an excuse to run all of those things through. Um, <laughs> I was just looking to get back to that '80s groove. To have the chant of the Antichrist and everything, and just the the craziness to it. Mm. But yeah. <laughs> But this, having said that, is still a favorite of mine on the album. Oh, yeah. I just love that that groove. Um, on to track five. This is the one I said is not danceable. Destruction. <laughs> <laughs> Opens with this screaming clip, a clip of like screaming and this very simple drum part. And the bass goes very 80s. Yeah. Um, but it's very disjointed. Like, as soon as you get comfortable in a groove, it changes. That's the thing. They are taking dance grooves that have been around the you know at this point since it's 88 they've been around the block mm -hmm. but i mean they're not using them in the way you'd expect the dance groove to be here you know well, that, not uh, on this song but we'll get to that issue yeah uh, probably with the next song um but i'm um, stick to destruction because i really didn't know what to make of that song i still don't <laughs> Because of how often it changes and how disjointed it is. Well, Which, right. It's it's very hypnotic at one point, but it's also there's so much testosterone at the uh, at the same time. Because uh, on previous songs, they they lay into a groove and they stay there, like I've said, but too long for me. This time, they don't do that at all. It, no. it can't make up its mind. And I I've never heard anything like that. I don't know if I like. <laughs> I, I've said this before. I don't know if I like it, but I respect it. Well, like they, they literally jump around with the, <laughs> with the sound turns the end. Yeah. It's just, I mean, of course, it's just the excuse for him to just yell destruction. Right, right. <laughs> that way. And the clips were getting a little monotonous, but again, I'm I'm, I'm gonna you know that consider that an ongoing criticism. The that clips are monotonous. of course are you, you can't have ministry without the clips. Yeah. <laughs> On to track eight, his boa. Um, starts with a very interesting sample. Um, and this one, this is where it started to turn a little for me. This could be the weirdest song on the album, I think. Because I really liked the first five. You know, well, lo loved the first four, respect the track five. This is where it started to turn on me. Um, I love the Middle Eastern feel of it, um, the tuned percussion. Um, yeah. But this is where it sounded very 80s. And I can name the gear they used. <laughs> I'm willing to bet it was a Lindrum, a DX7, maybe a, a Roland Juno or Jupiter. Um, and it, they were very cutting edge at the time. You know, I've, I've referred to the DX7, the Yamaha DX7 as the, the official yeah. synthesizer of the 80s. Um, but it really just dates it. And the problem I have is that they don't do anything different. It's just the sound you, you've heard on a billion 80s pop records. You know, they don't run do any effects. They don't do anything to twist it. They, they, it's really just the, the Middle Eastern beat mm -hmm. with some of the industrial, you know. Oh, and I love the Middle Eastern stuff aspects. Stuff that they're going with it. Yeah, they, that, that's, I think, the only thing they were going for here. Because, mm -hmm. I mean... I don't think anyone's ever done a Middle Eastern industrial song at that point. And I will say this is one of the cases where the groove goes on a long time, but didn't I didn't get bored with it? No, nah, no, nah, that's a, it's a good groove. But I, I'm talking mostly about the sound of the key, the, the sequencer, and the, the the bass parts and the, the yeah. synth bass parts and the drums. It's just I've heard that sound on so many fucking '80s records. Right. I can tell exactly what gear they're using, and I'm it's. I wish they would have run it through some synthesis, some some effects to change it. Um, it really kind of killed the rest of the album for me to hear this sound that is so over was so overdone at the time on all of these tracks. Um, but having said that, Hezbollah again, one of another one of my favorites because of that Middle Eastern feel <laughs> and that groove that just didn't get tiring, even though it went on forever. <laughs> it's it's one of the weird ones. Yeah, loved it. On to track seven, the title track, The Land of Rape and Honey. They weren't through being weird, though. <laughs> it does have a great groove. Um, this is, I, I meant, I said um, Deity was, was zombie. No, this is the one where it sounds like Rob Zombie to me, the vocal. Oh, yeah. And I, I think Al was a big influence. Um, and this is also where it felt really dated to me. 
Um, this is where I understood it was too much of its time when, <laughs> when you said that about Big Rack. Um, and also, just in general, this is one of the weakest ones for me. Um, I do like the groove, but it just gets monotonous about halfway through. You know, I agree. This is probably the weakest track on the album, and yet it's the one they made the title track. This yeah. is very strange. On to track eight, you know what you are. Of course, we didn't... Uh... We, we kind of missed the, we buried the lead on that last one. Okay. <laughs> the, the, you know, Roll back. they, um, of course, there's like all this Nazism in the song. Oh, his ball we're talking about. Okay. No, um, no Land of Rape and Honey. honey. Okay. Uh, I mean, which is pretty ball, which, I mean, the ballsiest part of it, because oh, yeah. some might miss that they were making fun of Nazis. Mm -hmm. Nazis might catch on that they're being made fun of. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair, fair. But Uncle uh, Lau doesn't give yeah. a fuck. Like I've said before, if it's my first time hearing a song, lyrics aren't the first thing I gravitate towards. It's the what? music, so. They, they were doing the Z hell. Yeah, I, and I, I was starting to get annoyed by all the 80s stuff, so yeah, I wasn't really paying attention to what was being said. It's Zig hell. Somehow, yes, I actually did. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's over and over again. That's like the Z hell. Maybe I just didn't understand what was being said. Um <laughs> It's them making fun of, you know, like Nazi music, right. you yeah. know, this dance beat in Zigel. Mm -hmm. On to track eight, you know what you are. Loved the panned laugh in the beginning. It goes from <laughs> one side to the other, and it's just this maniacal cackle. Oh, this could, uh, this is such a tough one because this one might be one of my pick. Uh, I don't know. I love this track so much. <laughs> this one, actually, th I, I changed my I actually have it in my notes. I misspoke. Random Rape and Honey is one of my weakest. I have more than one weakest, which is rare. This is flat out the weakest for me. We oh, yeah? completely disagree with this one. I was <laughs> bored of, oh, in just over a minute in. I, that cackle was about the only part I liked. Um, I did perk up when the chord changed briefly, but it was only very brief, and then we're back to that same riff. I mean, you've got uh, the the probably some of the best sampling on the album the the laugh from um i think it was from a few dollars more okay but yeah uh, of course the the title of the song you know what you are which is yelled by uh el tuco okay. the great eli wallach right. at the end of the good the bad the ugly and then this vocal distortion that I swear there's a star trek alien from the original series that used that distortion <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I kind of get the feeling that maybe if I gave this album more of a chance, I'd get over the fact that it's so dated and see more to like about it. But it's but I this it, is one lesson. I can only go by my initial lesson. It came through kind of weird in the mix that that I don't remember the vocal distortion. Like mm. it, it it didn't seem like it went over the music like it should have. This one it, it, like the mix really jumped out more than anything else. Like the weird uh -huh. sound with the vocals and the and the and the music. On to track nine. I prefer. Now here is where I'm going to say something very controversial. <laughs> this one reminded me a lot of an instrumental track that Wang Chung recorded for "To Live and Die in L.A." <laughs> if you watch the trailer for "To Live and Die in L.A.," there's this instrumental I I track that they about. use. Yeah, they, they did all the soundtrack. They did the entire soundtrack. Of the right, show. right. It was Wang Chung. This reminded me so much of that track. This is a lot more like what they did on Twitch. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, this I, is like older ministry. Yeah, I skimmed through Twitch and, and uh, with sympathy last yesterday. I think last night uh, to kind of refresh my memory because I'd heard yeah. them before. You know, you had told me about that they started off as a synth pop band, and I had to hear it with sympathy. <laughs> oh yeah, and, yeah. It, it's it's gothy synth pop. Um, <laughs> It's exactly what you're thinking about. Deliciously when I say embarrassing. Songs. Yeah. I would say on par with the first two Pantera, first, I think two or three Pantera albums. I think, two yeah. two. I think Cowboys is the third. Um, but yeah, it's on par with like the first uh, Pantera album. Um, but yeah, this really reminded me of Wang Chung. Um, that bass line it sounds like something from a video game. It's a cool little song. Bit of a mishmash with, you know, the, the styles that they were doing at the time. I, I did like the heavier drum part in the B section where you get a little bit of blast beat, but then mm. it just goes back to the Wang Chung groove. Um, and having said that, I kind of like Wang Chung, but I don't go to ministry to hear Wang Chung. <laughs> yeah, this is, it feels like it was a holdover from mm -hmm. a past yeah, album. Yeah. I wouldn't have been surprised by that. Um, on to track 10, flashback. 
Now, this one piqued my interest right away. It's got a great groove. Um, now, look, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, the vocal mix is better on this one. Could have been a little higher, but it's, it's yeah. better than previous ones. Got a little monotonous halfway through. Again, that's a ministry thing for me. Um, nice to hear a guitar solo, even though it's a bit messy. Like, it's properly <laughs> a guitar solo. Like, it could not be a keyboard. It's probably the angstiest song on the album. Um, it's probably why they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, because uh, it's definitely, like, you can't be this raw anymore without being, like, <laughs> scorning that ex-lover, though, and what you're going to do to him and everything, mm. all that. <laughs> if Al died, I think they'd get in. <laughs> I don't know. People died, and they're not going to. Freddy, Zappa. I'm going to no, pick no, this. No. Queen was on track to get in, but I don't. As I said before, I only. I think the only reason Zappa's in there is because he died, and mm. I love Zappa. I'm a huge fan. But you know, if Al died, maybe they'd get in as a tribute. I think I'm gonna pick this one as my favorite though, because okay. uh, it's just it's just so fucking balls mm. out. <laughs> and finally, on to track eleven, abortive. I kind of forgot this one's on the album actually, because my version of the album was a uh, tape. From, okay. made from someone's cd uh -huh. 45 minute side right it would cut off uh -huh. right in the middle of this so i'd hear maybe the first minute or so and then my first note on this club mtv it's very strange because it's like it's like a herbie hancock influence yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, really, really the weird really thing like is the bookends though mm -hmm. of like the drum machine from this and the drum machine from Stigmata in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Very, they seem like they're similar settings. Mm -hmm. Well, really like the bass part. Uh, it's kind of an extended solo. Yeah. And I think it is a real bass because I think I heard some hammer ons and pull offs. That's where you play a note, hammer on to the, another fret, yeah. and then pull off, um, which you can only do on a string instrument. You can't do that on a keyboard. Or if oh, you Paul can. Paul Barker you, had to have done something on this album. You, you can't. I mean, there's, there's real bass on some of the other songs. I've yeah. heard some real bass here. Um, but that, even though it's got a ton of effects on it, it sounds like a synthesizer, but I swear I heard a hammer on a pull off and you can't do that on a keyboard. So it probably was a real bass. Um, this one just really sounds like they were fucking around in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely. And my guess is the spatial wound was pretty, still quite fresh from yeah, Challenger well, at this point. That's too. true. A couple years um, earlier. Which... I mean, it's not even all that noticeable that that's what they're talking about there. It's like Is the, it the Challenger? Because I thought it was the first space shuttle. It's the first and, space shuttle, and yeah. And the Challenger was not the first one. No. So um, that's what I think the clip was from the first space shuttle, which yeah. was weird for our last track. It you is. Know, if they put that on the first track, that would make sense. <laughs> and then, so my first thing I know, it's an odd trace to end the album with a liftoff. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the groove just gets completely drowned out by the clips. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if I was annoyed by that because, you know, the sound was annoying me. The dated the, sound was annoying me. It's so, all a package, you know? It's um, the, the 80s sound with the, the clips, with the metal music going on. There's, you know, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> I just think, you know, I'll, I'll chalk it up to this was the middle period. <laughs> this was the transition, you know? They got better after this. They, right, you know, they view it, this as the first album, really. This was a step in the right direction. They got better afterward. Yeah, they they view this as their first real mm -hmm. album. Right. But the other two, although Twitch kind of, I mean, yeah. they Twitch, bridged the two. I, I just kind of skimmed it. I didn't give it a proper listen. But Twitch seemed like pretty hate machine a few, few, a few years earlier. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, Trent took it everything from this you know mm, there would yeah. be no nine inch nails if it was not for this right without a doubt so yeah the the, the influence is obvious mm -hmm. so uh, obvious question would you recommend it no oh, definitely oh i almost forgot one of the other sound okay. bites from you know what you are but come on motherfucker mm. <laughs> that is uh from the movie aliens of course okay yeah where he's shooting all of the come on get some why not come on motherfucker <laughs> so you would recommend it i would not no. um i love the first three tracks but i'll say first four because um you know golden dawn I, I i enjoyed the 80s sound um destruction was interesting you know <laughs> I, I didn't like it at first but by the time initially i didn't like it but by the time the end of the song came i was like yeah, okay i dig that but then it just got too dated and too of its time for me um i don't recommend it 
All right, that's it for the land of rape and honey. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Among the Living by Anthrax. This is a rare case where we both know the album going in. Yeah. Like really well. Because usually it's one of us or a guest picks it and you know one of us hasn't heard it before. Um, I think the Smithereens and maybe Cake are the only other cases where that's happened. Yeah, Cake is probably the one where, I mean, but Among the Living I have not listened to in like, mm -hmm. I, I can't, I'm trying to remember when, maybe like 20 years or so. Yeah, um, I think Caught in a Mosh is the only thing I listen to regularly because mm. it's a classic. Um, but a lot of it will be interesting to revisit. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there, there you are. You are.